Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, Marcelo. Uh, special thanks to all the students here helping to make this incredibly lovely event. Uh, just a second. Also, well, uh, say hello to all Zoomers here uh, and there and everywhere. So uh, I, I, I heard uh, philosophers call me ontologists, ontologists call me philosophers. Not a single neuroscience ever called me a neuroscientist. So I'm pretty sure I'm not a neuroscientist. Uh, but I do think that my ethological approach perhaps could contribute or give some insights, some of the things you guys are discussing. Uh, the title of my presentation is Rika Through the Looking Glass. I'm going to introduce you to Rika briefly. Some notes on social cognition and normativity. Also, uh, I must thank all my collaborators, Laura Jean Schmidt. She's the creator of the International Wolf Center. I owe most of my academic life to her. Shannon Barber-Meyer from the United States Geological Service. Eloise Algaier from Caxias do Sul University and the X Lab. And Joana Maria Sulik from Arctic University of Norway, also collaborator of the X Lab. So the top, this is Rika, okay? She's a wolf pup I've been studying. And the four topics I want to talk with you guys, we're gonna down to the rabbit hole. We're going to look ourselves in the wall and see who's the social of them all. We try to leave Wonderland and see if we should or if someone should be afraid of the big bad wolf. So as just a framework, I want to separate myself from uh, Turiel's research focus on cognitive complexity as central to normativity in sync stages of moral development. The, four, the first four encompass obedience out of fear of punishment and the notion of duties to the group. The five consists in the recognition of contractual obligation and the six adds rational concept of normativity. Turiel uh, later on also established that conventional moral distinctions would be established by children when empathizing with victims of specific forms of transgressions. And the perception of moral violations will lead them to the learning of a prescriptive norm against a specific behavior, mostly by projecting the pain that the same action will cause on itself. So uh, Turiel's position adds to normative behaviors the same cognitive complexity that some researchers will see as necessary for the development of self-recognition, uh, necessary Therefore, for the projection and recognition of rules such as do no harm or cause no pain to others. So uh, in this stage, a theory of social domain uh, uh, could be presented in which infant age individuals acquire moral normativity through their collective experiences within the social nuclei through which they transit. Broadly speaking, in this paradigm, uh, normativity will depend on a social cognitive complexity capable of performing rational interventions to contain the selfish and instinctual irrational inclinations of our nature, uh, where heteronomy would lead to the autonomous orientation of the most advanced development characterized by reason, morality, and than cooperation. Uh, according to Hoffman, uh, normativity will be regulated by affective dispositions based on a complex social cognition in five stages, primary circular reaction, then goes to social conditioning, behavior mimicry, four and five, language mediation and the development of emotional attachment through verbal reports and the capacity for emotional projection. Joshua Green and Hyde kind of start to criticize this idea, uh, but they seek to identify the specific function of social cognition from an interconnected set of norms, practices, and identities that work together to inhibit selfishness and make social cooperation possible. Normativity will be based on a range of brain systems developed in a form of moral cognition. Uh, within uh, a rationalist paradigm, uh, 
uh, one can state at the stages four or five will require uh, complex, like I say, complex cognitive process and therefore the capacity for self recognition, for example. Following the advance of this paradigm timeline, the moral phenomena would then not be circumscribed in a set of knowledge codified in universal ethical systems or general decision making procedures. On the contrary, you to refer to individuals capable of self-recognition endowed with complex social cognition. Green and high geosystem, for example, uh, reinforced and moral cognition uh, will be based on complex brain system, specifically dedicated to the processing of social norms, which can be related to some form of self-recognition. Uh, these conceptions are controversial and have been challenging by the empirical literature in different behavioral sciences. Uh, the point here is that there would be only there wouldn't be only one form of social cognition, and the cognitive constituents of normativity will be no different from other forms of cognition. That's my point. Uh, at the same time, the criterion of complexity can be questioned as a touchstone for the different nuances of normativity found in nature. So the first point to challenge this position is to investigate the stages of self-recognition and how and if uh, they occur in species other than humans. So uh, the first, uh, the mirror self-recognition test, the MSR, uh, is usually applied to assess the self-perception capacity of a species. And the standard interpretations indicate that animals that pass the MSR have self-recognition. More narrow interpretations suggest that the test measures the ability to solve problems, considering self-recognition ability as associated with social cognition. While more broader analysis consider the success in reacting to the mirror as indicative of the ability in differentiate oneself from other objects in the environment, whether or not by identify oneself to the mirror's reflection. Uh, Shannon and Laurie, they identify self-awareness uh, as a spectrum. So wolves, for example, have high social, tolerant, considerate and cooperative behaviors. Uh, in the wild, they coordinate hunts with use of foresight and planning, while their captive counterparts uh, succeed in following causal clues, human eyes, and conspecific behaviors to solve tasks. Uh, visual communication is central for expressing hostile or friendly intentions and has a specific functions within the pack, such as demonstrating social status and conveying information to group members. So uh, it's kind of surprising that to date wolves have failed the MSR test and the few published results make it difficult to understand the context that influenced the result. For example, uh, protocols, interspecific variation, environmental conditions, age of the wolves, etc., etc., etc. So uh, the criteria here to determine whether an animal exhibits self-recognition in the MSR test was characterized by the demonstration of mirror-guided self-directed behaviors from the examinations of body parts seen only in the reflection to the presence or absence of social response directed towards the mirror. Uh, behavior criteria uh, were defined as corresponding here to the four categories associated with MSR test. Uh, social response, the second physical inspection of the mirror, repetitive mirror testing, and self-directed behaviors. Uh, so given the lack of more precise studies and considering that understanding the spectrum of self-recognition can help us to understand social cognition and evolution of also visual communications in mammals with complex social lives, uh, the International Health Center and myself, the X Lab, uh, and Caxias do Sul University, we sought to develop an empirical study on the subject. Um, the first step was to relate the four behavior categories within the description of the behaviors of wolves, uh, previously classified by traditional etograms, 
and they were categorized by Shannon and Laurie in the article reference in the slide. So the social response will be responding as if the reflection in the mirror were unfamiliar or strange, threatening counts specifically with behavior such as lip curl, earth flat and out of the side, raised heckles, etc. cetera. A physical mirror inspection will be pawing the mirror, sniffing at the frame, approaching for visual inspections of the mirror and support structure, and visually examining the area behind the mirror. Uh, repetitive mirror testing was classified as repeated non-aggressive mirror approaching as determined by ear, tail, and body postures, parallel walking in front of the mirror, or other repeated movements such as head bob, allowing wolves to observe the what we call one-to-one -one correspondence between their actions and the image in the reflection, and self-directed behaviors. Behaviors direct towards self when viewing the mirror, also including physically and visually examining the face, gazing, and or viewing and examining body parts in the mirror not normally visible. Um, considering that uh, the limited information av available on Wolves understanding our ability to use a mirror was carried out with adult individuals already acclim acclimatized with reflective surface and considering that there is research pointing the ability of dog puppies with less than four months to react to the mirror, I suggested observations of wolf pups, in this case, Rika, when she was less than three months old. Um, here is a short video that shows the acclimatization process with the quick look in slow motion uh, uh, as the maximum uh, spontaneous interactions that Rika had with the covered mirror. Uh, behaviors here, they were registered in verification within intervals of 30 seconds for identification with traditional etogram. Uh, covered mirror controls were used to determine if similar behavior occurred when Rika could not see herself. All behaviors evaluated were active, spontaneous, or intentional by Rika without any additional stimulation. Uh, possible disagreement among observers were resolved by consensus following a frame-by-frame -frame review of the relevant sections of the video record. Um, so this is this is the acclimatization pro uh, process. So here is a short video that shows. Uh, sorry, the, this is probably the the first documented uh, reaction of Wolf to the mirror. Uh, given, of course, this is a work in progress that we only started a few months ago. Uh, I still don't have like a full analysis of how Rika's reactions. Uh, next year, I promise I'll be able to, to share some of the results out and give a full understanding of the experimental, of the experiment. So the first reaction uh, to the mirror was as if the reflection was a count specific characterizing a first stage social response. The investigation of the mirror for the first day lasted about 15 minutes until she lost interest. Uh, there were constant investigation of the mirror by pal touching, parallel walking. This was characterized as second and third stage of social response. Her last reaction to the, uh, to the first day consisted of a quick gaze and the mirror and a head bob. This might indicate a one-to-one -one correspondence, although you need to see if this is repeated in the following days, we're still analyzing and preparing the data. Uh, so far, uh, in terms of ethological observation, it's possible to establish that there was a learning curve for reactions based on Rika's perception of her reflex. Initially, she reacts as if the mirror uh, reflection was a conspecific. She reproduced behavior like what we documented in her encounter with dog puppies and adult wolves through the fence. Except, it is an important exception, in the mirror, she did not show any of the, social, uh, the vocalizations performed by real con conspecifics. Uh, during the first day of the experiment, she already showed advances in the perception of the reaction and relationship with the mirror. Until the extension of this is in the other days of the experiment is still uh, inconclusive. Uh, this may indicate that visual clues, visual cues uh, are central to learning social response in wolves. 
even micro expressions, movements that can trigger some behavioral response, providing some insight perhaps into how social cognition develop in mammals with complex social lives. So uh, having identified this point, uh, it's time to get back to the question of social cognition and normativity, trying to leave Wonderland back to Kansas. Uh, in this case, actually back to Minnesota, not, not Kansas. So let's try to leave this wonderland of rationality. Uh, Daniel Kelly questioned Toriel's uh, framework for distinguishing moral from conventional reasoning, pointing out that reasoning about moral transgression may look quite conventional, while in other cases, reasoning about putatively conventional matters takes on moralist characteristics. While Heirich established that the cognitive evolutionary accounts usually posit a distinctive norm system constituted by a set of mechanisms and adaptive heuristics for acquiring the norms of one's local community, as well as intrinsic motivational process that uh, dispose agents to conform to these norms and enforce them on others. So, uh, uh, Kelly critics the amoralist characterization of the moral domain as artificially narrow due to its commitment to moral rationalism and focus on specific populations. So the central explanation for, for example, for Kelly's research project has not been moral thinking as itself, but rather the broader capacity for identifying, conforming to and enforcing social rules that dictate which behaviors are, are required, allowed, or forbidden for members of any given community. So norms so construed might govern prototypical moral domains concerning matters of harm and fairness, while also regulating a much wider range of so-called conventional activities, uh, from rules about queuing up to the grocery store to governing the proper preparation of food. So while this approach leaves open the possibility that moral thinking might constitute an empirically distinct type of normative cognition, does not start with the a priori assumption that this must be the case. Rather, new cognitive science of norms takes heterogeneity and cross-cultural diversity and cross-species diversity uh, in the contents of normativity thinking as its starting point. Uh, Green actually reveals his initial approach by poses the question succinctly by claiming that uh, the field of moral cognition does not study a distinctive set of cognitive process, uh, who instead adopt a plur pluralistic approach and pay more attention to cross-cultural diversity, uh, cross-species diversity, the moral domain might also encompass a much wider set of behaviors grounded on values, including in group loyalty, respect for authority, and more important, truthful behaviors. So uh, the methodological approach here is inspired by the way ethologists study the phenomenon of animal culture. They treat a behavior as tradition if it is shared by two or more individuals in a social unit, and it is acquired via social learning and transmitted across generations. Christine Andrews and Restra in this in this paper, uh, they they said they said that instead of we adopt like definitions of social norms framed in terms of their underlying psychological properties, we can instead conceptualize social norms in terms of the community level patterns of social behaviors that those mechanisms are invoked to to explain. So the kind of pluralism I have in mind uh, in the psychology of norms is modeled after pluralistic approach in social cognition. While early approach in the field took it for granted that we came to understand social world by predicting and explaining behavior in terms of propositional attitudes, pluralistic approach have stress the importance of alternative strategy for predicting and exp uh, explanation, uh, including representations of the situation, traits, stereotypes, and notably social norms. So the key insight of a pluralistic approach is in social cognition has been the understanding the social world as more messy, complex process, uh, and well, that, that for that there, there will be a variety of ways of doing social cognition, not simply 
one. Uh, the approach is here place only minimal psychological constraints on which behaviors can count as cultural in that it assigns a central role to social learning. Even if the psychological underpinnings of culture are not specified, it still have a precise definition, namely a particular pattern of regular behavior presents in a group of individuals acquired through social learning. And yet it's something that one could in theory observe in a wide range of species. So uh, normative regularity could be, is understood actually by Western Andrews as socially maintained patterns of behavior conformity within a community. So this emphasis on behavior conformity distinguishes normative regularities from purely prescriptive norms that are not wildly adopted by a community and hence not manifested in concrete behavioral patterns. So uh, the concept of social maintenance as intended to capture an element of norm psychologies that's often framed in terms of punishment or punitive attitudes. So the idea is that social norms are not mere patterns of conformity, but rather patterns where conformity can be rewarded and non-conformity can be met with some sort of social pressure. This social pressure is involved in social norms are not limited to negative incentives against norm violations because of course, positive reinforcements behavior also have a role to play here. Uh, such positive pressures might include behaviors uh, that sign out social approval, such as friendly body language, explicit praise, including norm conformers in social group and activities. Um, Understood this way, social maintenance refers to any social response to norm conformity or violation that incentivizes norm conformity, be it through positive or negative reinforcements. Um, so the central methodological proposal is that normative regularities should be the primary explanada for a theory of psychology of norms with this methodological framework in place. Uh, perhaps you'll be able to fully articulate a central empirical thesis. Norm acquisition, norm conformity, and norm maintenance can be enacted via a variety of different underlying cognitive process of varying degrees of complexity. What these processes have in common is not a unified cognitive architecture, but rather a shared cause role in sustaining normative irregularities. The idea is to adopt uh, here now an emotivist approach based on empirical pluralism, paying more attention to the diversity among species, cultures, and populations to better understand the relationship between normativity, social cognition, and moral phenomena. So who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Uh, well, the rabbit for sure. Uh, the hypothesis here is that embodied emotional reactions are elicited by homologous brain systems in social mammals, a uh, statement compatible with an empirical pluralism because there might be some overlappings between species, and, but is grounded more important on evolutionary uh, perspective. So an embodied theory of emotions takes emotional reactions to be akin to lungs in our briefing animals, characteristics that are so important, they arose once and have been conserved ever since by natural selection. So in this sense, each emotion must be understood as a set of programs that guide and body and behavior responses when a specific type of problem is encountered. So uh, the scheme goes a little bit like this, okay? Uh, an error uh, is the embodied state caused by the body's feedback associated with specific danger or a specific problem. The brain registers this bodily change as representatives of danger. Such activity can be related to the detection and appraisal of uh, uh, social behavior, collective behavior, including social exclusion, even an increased focus on social evaluation. This process mediates the emotional responses to potentially dangerous scenarios to play an active role in error detection and uh, monitoring to trigger appropriate motor responses. In a primary stage, there are expectations such as not fall from a cliff, wait, you're walking near a cliff, 
or to get food when you're hungry. Fear and anxiety, for example, are embodied signals of immediate danger and the least awareness of an error in a specific scenario. In a social stage, the expectations turn into instinctual demands such as feed me and be truthful to the group. Happiness, joy, sadness, guilty, anger, pride, shame, disgust are signals of social danger to at least awareness to an error of an error in a specific social scenario. Uh, the embodied, uh, the embodied conditions, uh, the, sorry, the embodied emotional reaction as well as the cognitive process associated with these responses are the same in all of those cases. That is. There is no specific cognitive process that distinguishes the first from the second scenario, only the advent of social instincts that incline certain mammals to live in groups, and with that, gave rise to a new problem to be faced by this species. In this sense, understanding how uh, the different forms of social cognitions occur is relevant to distinguishing between general rules and moral normativity, for example. Uh, so in, to conclude, I'm going to present uh, now some pilot studies on the role of uh, emotions in wolf pack behaviors. Uh, I would have start with actually all of us uh, and the group who have started this part of the research last year, but as happened to all of us due to the, to the pandemic, only now you are able to start experiments in this presentation. Now uh, we will have focus on showing how we are creating a database of emotional responses in wolves to let them identify when they emerge in their social context. Also, we'll be able uh, in the near future to compare their embodied expressions with humans and other primates using Ekman's facial action coding system and its version of canines known as dog facts, okay? So, uh, the technique we are using is geometric morphometric and it aims to analyze coordinates in a Cartesian plane that lead to a continuous variation of facial and body movements. In case of Riker's observation, age subdivision is necessary. Uh, wolf pups show allometric growth of the skull. Uh, so the samples uh, will be subdivided into groups according to growing period range using anatomical, anatomical landmarks. Um, considering that its application in wolves is unprecedented, this would also lead to a database for future behavior studies of the species. Uh, it's noteworthy that this mapping can be applied later to other organisms, leading to an objective comparison between expressions in different species of mammals based on homologous physiological structures. So this is the 18 landmarks we're using for uh frontal on the frontal face there's also from the side but due time I, I only show on the front uh consider uh this image is being generated uh by by ourselves in the study conducted at the, the international center it starts on this late july we continue on next may to august of 2022 perhaps in january we, we're trying to see if it will be possible and for data collection, images of the frontal and lateral view of the face will be used, allowing analysis on different side faces of the same subject. So uh, this is an example of anger, and this is the vectors of the variation of the, the landmarks in anger. Uh, we have that for all of the emotions I mentioned. Uh, we're trying to build that. We don't have for all of them yet. So anger for example, is a basic emotion that serves a variety of adaptive functions involved in the regulation of physiological and psychological process related to self-defense, also plays an important role in the regulation of social and interpersonal behaviors by motivating individuals to repair uh, trans transgressions. So uh, emotion is the activation of uh, of some form of response manifested by motor representations associating autonomic and somatic response expressed in standardized bodily reactions, basically that. Uh, this is from a, uh, a paper published by myself and Joanna this year, since we could not have uh, all the empirical data, we present a model. To some of them, uh, we already seen that correlate, some we are still testing, but the idea is that 
first we have a, a problem that is reproduction we have a functional system to do that sex we can explain all of that by a uh, third perspective like by evolutionary principles but wolves do not act on evolutionary principles in a sense that's not what drives them i never seen like a female wolf come to the male and say something like hey let's pass those social genes to next generation right uh, that's not how they flirt they have desire so desire increased likelihood of sexual contact but when you have animals with a uh, highly parental investment you need to keep the mate okay so you have two functional systems it's bonding and mate protections and then you have the rise of happiness joy and sadness happiness is something that strengthens bond between parents parents and offspring joy reduces the stress of companions and offspring and sadness if you watch it inside out signals internal stress and elicits friendliness from companions and offspring but if you are a social group you need to cooperate groups that cooperate better have more advantage because they preserve more energy to defense of territory to hunt and wolves are highly cooperative highly functional wolves do not have alphas in the pack they we call only breeding pair because it's the the couple that eats and there's not a dominance to to imposition of force so we have what we call biological altruism what is biological altruism it's not to do with philosophical metaphysical altruism or religious altruism it's just a course of action in which you're going to spend more energy than you're going to get so hunting for my brother's cubs for example uh, but what what happens if I not do that? Well, if I not do that, I receive anger for the others. So anger motivates others to repair transgressions, motivates me to repair my transgression. And if I show guilty, I probably would be harder for me to do it again. So it repairs own transgressions of reciprocity. And you have some forms of group organization, which leads to domination, hierarchy. Domination doesn't need to be domination through force. We have pride, shame, and disgust. Pride displays high status. Shame displays submission. Shame also pacified possible aggressors. And disgust excludes group members who violate social rules. So anger and disgust here are very different. Anger leads you, to, you want contact. It brings you closer, okay? Uh, while disgust is something you don't want to smell, you don't want to see. So it will be like, uh, usually it is the, perceiving like the, the more, uh, the, there, there is a variation of uh, like a difference from uh, no uh, social so do socially wrong from really deviant behaviors. Okay, so uh, this is a relation developed, like I said, by myself and Joanna uh, between social functionality of emotions, the most basic uh, to socially complex behaviors, and the problem they solve. And finally, the distinctions between social discomfort and deviant behavior can be perhaps measured by the intensity of the embodied emotional expressions. And you can see that through the vectors because the more intense expressions, larger, uh, greater will be the, the vectors. Uh, and this is related to the harm caused to the group. Uh, in short, uh, the wide range of social and emotions exists in so far as different social and antisocial behaviors uh, that are beneficial or not to maintain social organization, uh, being adaptive responses based on a plural social cognition developed from different scenarios. And thank you very much. I hope I don't extrapolate my time. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mateus. Questions? Questions, questions? So I have one. Um, it seems that you're the cup that appears to be in front of a mirror. Um, it seems that the, the reaction we've seen is a reaction of a lack of self recognition. It, it seems that. Uh, that Haika is afraid because she does not recognize as her own self. Instead, she recon she recognizes someone of the same species. It, it's I mean I'm I'm just kind of 
you're, guessing. You're, you're right. You're right. I, I'm guessing and I'm trying to uh, speculate. Uh, what kind of? I mean, what will be the the reasons for that kind of uh, reaction? And also, I mean, the reaction seems the one of fear. I would say. Uh, I'll bet that she's having a lot of a middle -er, I mean, reaction in terms of brain activity. Uh, because you see fear, I say, I mean, it, it kind of uh, wake, her, wake her, wakes her up to, to something in the environment. So I'll, I'll bet that we'll have a middle -er, uh processing there. So I just want to, to explore that specific movie about the, 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 the reaction to the mirror. I mean, in just comparing with other species as well, we know that bottleneck dolphins, uh, they use the mirror as they would in a beauty salon. You know, they, they really kind of play with the mirror. They, they, they're clearly recognizing themselves. We know that bonobos recognize themselves. We know that uh, chimpanzees clearly recognize themselves. So how do you, I mean, and I had, the, I, I've seen that live with my dog. She, 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 she does not recognize herself. And she had once this, rea the, the first time that she's seen uh, her face at the mirror, she reacted as, as she was recognizing another animal. And she started, she just suddenly started to bark because she was like kind of defending her territory. Uh, so I just want to see your considerations on that. Okay, that's that's a great question. Actually, I think it helps me clarify some of the points. Uh, the video shows Raika absolutely first reaction. Okay, um, and you're right; it is definitely a reaction of fear. She's not recognizing herself at the moment. Okay, uh, okay. Th there are some contextual factors that might influence that. Okay, she Raika is like unique because she's a single child. Okay, that's very rare in wolves. So they did not have like brothers and sisters to see, to play. Uh, in terms of wolf management, we have to let her play with dog pups. So she have some interactions. So interact through the dog pups through the fence. So probably this is influencing her reaction here. Okay. Uh, although like I said, they did not have any vocalizations. So that's a sign that there, that there is something different. Okay. Uh, at the first, because wolves, do make vocalizations when they see a con specific. Uh, but definitely she's not seeing as herself at the moment. Uh, I'm gonna go back a few steps uh, on other research. Like adult wolves never respond to the mirror, okay? Uh, we talk a little bit uh, with Peter uh, that as well. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the stains on wolves, I don't think it worked. I think it's a problem because wolves are very used to have stains. They are hunters. They have always blood or dirty on their face. So it's not something significantly different. And uh, aesthetic aspects are not important to wolves. So it's not something they will go, you know, see there to calm their hair or something like that. Uh, and they're not sure response. So I had a hunch, it's merely a hunch that wolves are just not self-centered, okay? Uh, and the fact that they do not, adult wolves do not respond to the mirror, uh, at the same time they respond to every other living being, shows that there is something different. Uh, my point here is that Raika, on the, and like I say, I, I wish I had more, uh, more of the analysis to do, just to go a little bit on the protocols, why not? Like uh, each of the, like was, uh, each of the, every time there is a movement in any body part, you need to froze the flame. Uh, the frame and if you remember from from the video there are some grids on the background so we have to correct the angle so we don't have distortion or you do the the geometric morphometric analysis so this take like six to eight months to do it to process all the all the frames and all the videos so we don't only finish like the the first day um but uh she did and th that's why you're going back to the ethological observation more traditional ethological observation she did have a social learning curve on the first day because uh, I do not have the frame and the uh, the video here uh, to show, but the, her last movement was like a head bob and a gaze. 
gaze is usually indicate the first picture is of Rika, she's gazing, okay? Like the ears pricked, the, the more, and she did that to the mirror. It's inconclusive if this continues to the other days. And why is this inconclusive? Uh, it, it did say fear, and I do believe she's, she's afraid there, okay? Contextually, that, that's, she's definitely not ashamed, she's definitely not feeling guilty. She jumps back. She jumps back. Exactly. She, she's afraid. Hello, hello. But uh, the good thing about geometric morphometrics is that we can capture like micro movements that traditional observations cannot. So you can see even the small path, even like purple dilatations differentiation. If this is related to, to what we can find and correlate to other databases, they might show like uh, small nuances and small differences that might lead us to a better observation. So that's why, uh, I mean, I know she gazed on the other days, but I need to see if this is a real gaze on the mirror, if the, the eyes are, uh, are pointing like to something behind. I don't know. We need to really be sure that there is a correlation. So that's why I'm not being like, okay, she did show some, but she showed uh, a learning curve through the self-recognition. How far is that? I honestly, Gabriel, I don't know, but it's most that uh, other researchers found on terms of, of all self-recognition. So I don't know if he answers your question, but uh, but yeah, you are right. This is not, she's not recognizing his, herself. She's just merely dis differentiating the image uh, from herself because um, far she is differentiating the, 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 the reflection from herself and she's responding to that. Uh, and one thing we, we aim to analyze if is these emotional reactions to their mirror, if there are any small micro difference from her reactions to real worlds, because she's now living with a pack. So we are continuing to do this study. I don't know if it answers your question. It's, it's fine. Uh, my other question will go in an absolutely different direction. Uh, I mean, Mirror recognition would imply some form of self-consciousness, right? But let's shift gears to, to decision-making. I mean, you mentioned the cases when each one of the animals are spelled out of the, the bag. I mean, uh, is that a collective decision? It is a decision that is made by the leader of a bag. How is this process? Is, uh, oh, could you, could we say, this is like, uh, I mean, he, he used the term, uh, the wolves, normativity, he used terms like that. Are we anthropomorphizing these animals? Uh, can, can we clearly speak of uh, uh, normativity, social criteria for uh, uh, decision-making wolves, or that would be some form of anthropomorphization of these animals? Uh uh, I don't think it's anthropomorphization. I do believe that anthropomorphization happens. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna first address the the, the the anthropomorphization part of your question. Uh, the fact that you do anthropo anthropo anthropomorphize wolves uh, doesn't mean that they don't have like a specific form of, of social normativity. Uh, Wolves, especially if you are in a wolf country, they elicit a lot of uh, intense emotions. So it's very rare to find a person that is neutral about wolves. They either hate it and want to be extincted, or what we call at all center like crazy wolf people. You know, like oh, I have a shamanistic connection to this animal, and you see people projecting their own emotions, their own experiences a lot. Okay. Uh, and that's a good thing about this technique, if I believe, uh, of geometric morphometric uh, and using like the facial action coding systems, because you can say, no, uh, he's not feeling guilty for killing this, this, uh, this deer. He actually feeling proud. And I can show you that. I can show you that he's feeling proud uh, because you see the, the tail out, uh, the, the stuff at chest and all that. Now, now I mean, we're, we have another leap forward. Beyond normativity, now you're talking about morality in wolves. That, that's like a yet a leap forward. So yeah, I, I gonna I gonna I, I I can address this the second second leap forward. Okay, 
Uh, the second you said about a uh, form of normativity, a social normativity, uh, if they have their own and how the how the expelling, you know, like how, how they ex might expel. First, say it's pretty rare that it happens in the wild and captivity as well because they have less choice. Uh, what we see happening is like increasing in bullying. Okay, and it's always a social decision. Of course, uh, one or two O's might will be the first, but the others will comply. Okay, so uh, the intensity depends of the harm done. Okay, so uh, we are implying a third thing. I mean, they have a, like a, like like judges. They have kind of a dosology for for punishment. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not, I do believe we can understand their, their normativity. A positive correlation between the, the intensity of the harm to yeah. the community and the intensity of the, of the response, counter, the yeah, the response, response. the yeah, bullying that they suffered. That, that's definitely happened. Okay. okay. That's definitely happened. Uh, for example, if you steal food, if you, if someone is eating uh, and you steal the food while the, while, let's say we're both back, okay? I'm eating and you steal my food, like pun, uh, push me aside, uh, that's wrong, okay? If I leave to get some water and to get my food, that's okay. Wolves do not have hierarchy when hunting. So no matter if you're lower in the hierarchy, if you pick up the best part, it's yours, unless you leave it. But if you have pups or a pregnant female, they eat first. And if you do not do that, you can see the 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 uh, an, an augmentation and in the intensity of the the response, the aggressive response. The, uh, those expressions are sort of anger. You know, you see that, that there's a variance between the two, uh, the one that the ears more back or the ears more front. So uh, you can measure that that there is there is some correlation between uh, inten the the harm done and the intensity of aggression. Uh, okay. Um, if I were to anthropomorph anthropomorphize that to humans, uh, we could say something like, um, you give me good morning and I turn my face and say, okay, this guy, is, I don't like it. Okay. So, that, so, but, uh, if, uh, you give me a wallet to hold and I give you back without the money, that's different. Okay. That's different behavior. So you respond different. It's not only go, not gonna like me. The more your emotional response will be different. So you can see these variances. Okay, uh, I do. Uh, Christine uh, wrote that to me. Uh, some some mails and uh, we're discussing the idea that emotions are actually a spectrum. So from guilty to shame, depending on the contest, you will be more on one side or the other, and all that. So I do believe that wolves have some sort of spectrum, okay, uh, in terms of emotional reaction. So uh, the, uh, the reason we are anthropomorphizing and projecting emotions at them, we do that. If you pick up the narrations of Net Geo, they are terrible because they're highly, highly anthropomorphic. Uh, doesn't mean they don't have. Uh, so my point is, what triggers a specific emotional reaction related to a violation of social norms in wolves will be very different from what triggers in humans or other species. But once it's triggered, what happens next is not is more or less the same. Okay, um, and we do see like uh, a hard case, uh, a specific case of the the wolves killing the the leader of the pack. Okay, because she was too, uh, too violent, she was highly oppressive, she didn't share food, and one day she woke up, they, they killed her, okay, and the, the female that was the, on the bottom of the hierarchy assumed the leadership, she adopted the child of the, her sister, uh, and she became one of the longest leaders of Yellowstone, so and they they follow her okay the pack follow her okay so uh how far is how far it goes this this social this complexity honestly uh i cannot answer it's something uh we are merely touching the tip of the iceberg here because since the 
well, since until today, usually you do traditional etograms. So you basically uh, look at uh, major bodily movements, what triggers those movements, and what's the reaction. But the dr what drive is usually uh, categorized by ethologists in a broader concept, of the broader category of instinct, either sexual instinct, either social instinct. What we're trying to do here is go beyond that. Okay, what really drive in these animals are not are not the same thing in every situation. And, and then it goes: Do wolves have morality? Okay, uh, I would say yes. Okay, my answer now is yes. For one specific reason, wolves do not depend on the adult wolves do not depend on the group to survive. Okay, uh, there are studies that show that wolves can uh, acquire uh, six percent more food hunting alone than within the pack. That's a lot for an animal that depends on hunting. Okay, so they are very good hunters. Of course, there are uh, a lot of uh, evolutionary reasons for wolves to to stay together, like defending of territory. Uh, defending the food you hunt. Okay, I have uh, some footage on Yellowstone on uh, a wolf hunt. I, I believe it was a deer, and it comes like uh, coyotes and crows and bears, and the wolf cannot eat what he hunt. So the pack is important for that, and most important, teaching the cubs to hunt, teaching the cubs the 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 how to behave socially even within the pack. So. Um, the, the, but but they but after they learn they can they can uh, go away okay and usually they do so my point here is they have uh, bio, I'm gonna call it biological freedom to break the rule to eat more to get more advantages for being selfish but they do not do why they do not do I'm not saying they do they are not doing because they they have like a, a strong ideology or no they have a biological within the natural cause, we have emotions that control. So it'll be, uh, it's hard to break the bond, you know? So I can eat more, but uh, I, I call in humans the O effect, okay? What's the O effect? Go to a maternity in a hospital, sit in front of the nursery, see how many people pass the babies and say, oh, they, they are parasite of our affections, okay? So they create these bonds from, from the, Starting, it's harder to break. And if you break, you can see body postures that are directly correlated to Darwinian's three principles of emotional expressions and the expression of emotions of men and animals, uh, such as uh, like when they do something that is praised by the pack, they like stuff their chest, they know, and when they do their nod, they like literally put the tail between the legs. They duck, yeah. They duck. So okay. the tight is it. So uh, but what triggers, what behavior triggers, perhaps in, in, in the next presentation, I might be able to show in the next presentations because it's something uh, we are currently looking at. So uh, I have more precise to say, oh, this is this, this, this ignites that, this is that. But so far, it's just like a general model I can okay. present. Great. Any questions from Zoom? So, so now I ask you, Mateus, thank you. You said that happiness, pride, joy, pride and joy are a signal of a social danger to elicit awareness of an error in a social scenario. What will be an error in a social scenario in wolves? Would it be when you don't behave as the group expect, or is it something else? Uh, hi, Sinara. So nice, so nice to to hear from you. Uh, yes, actually, untruthful behaviors. So let me let me put uh, in two categories here. So that, that implies like that they have some notion of truth as well. Uh, an instinctual notion of behave as expected. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this behavior is expected. Uh, I, that, that, that's the point. Uh, I'm gonna answer scenario, I'm gonna go back to that because that's interesting. Uh, so, uh, basically, we have uh, social pressures within the group that expectations, okay? And this is directly related to the capacity of break the norms, to break the rules. For example, uh, 
um, I, I don't remember, we, we talk a lot on the, the coffee breaks, I don't know who, who I was talking, but I think it was Carolina. Uh, imagine that I, I cannot lie, I'm biologically impossible to lie. So we don't have any expectations for me not telling the truth. Okay, you don't need to have that because you know I'm gonna tell you the truth. But if I can lie and you rely on me, you create a space, oh no, I trust you, you you not lie. So wolves can break the rules. So by if an animal has the ability, the, the elbow, the biological elbow room to break the rules, well, it certainly creates some form of instinctual expectations to not to behave in a certain way. Okay. Uh, so, Sinara, uh, I'll say any form of untruthful behaviors, such as uh, stealing food from the cubs, for example, I think that's the most, most, uh, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, we do have wolves that do not uh, engage that much in territorial defense, others engage a little more. So. Uh, I wouldn't say that's highly relevant, but the life threat situations, if a wolf uh, do put itself into to harm's way to protect other, that is certainly that it's praised by the pack. You can see that he, he, he goes up a little, okay? He, he, he gets some social credit. So uh, yeah, basically I'll say it's when you do not behave as you're expected to behave. Uh, and that's, uh, and to finish my answer, I think we're ahead of time. Uh, the the breeding pair are not above the rules of the tr of the pack. Okay. okay. Thanks, so. Mateus. Big round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all.